I remember the tears falling on my dinner plate and the kids just looking at me, not knowing what to say. And Georgia says, Mandy, he says, like, you know, things be fine. And I'm going, but Jesus Christ, I says, we've, we've nothing left here. It's gone. And it's like as if my baby was literally taken away from me. And then wondering what's going to pay the mortgage next month and what's going to pay the car next month or whatever. And then you're you're just thinking, Jesus, this is this is not good. Hello and welcome to episode 44 of Gary Talks. This week I'm joined by the wonderful Mandy Maher, owner of Catwalk Model Agency, the platform by Mandy Maher Influencer Agency, and Mandy is also a stylist on Virgin Media's television show Ireland AM. In this episode, there's a few tears but plenty of laughs as Mandy gives a great insight into the joys and struggles of running your own business, the importance of challenging yourself seizing opportunities, focusing and educating yourself on your competition, helping others through goodwill, staying grounded, upskilling, adapting and never giving up. She talks about trying to start a career in modelling as a teenager, leaving college to pursue her true dreams, the pressures in the fashion industry, building a family of models, the massive effect COVID had on her business, then having to start a completely new business, balancing life as a business owner and as a mom of three, what businesses need to do today to stay relevant, and what advice she has for anyone starting out in business. This is Mandy Maher on Gary Talks, so sit back, relax and enjoy. This is a GK Media Podcast. Mandy Maher. Thank you for joining us on Gary Talks. You're welcome. Thank you, Gary, for having me. Well, delighted to have you in. You've worked all over the country. You've worked abroad as well. You've done big events overseas. You've worked with so many different people, so many different industries. You've had so many women and men working on your books as well over the years. I just think you have such life experiences that most people in an industry don't get. There's so much I think we have to talk about. But first off, for me, as I was saying before we started recording, Catwalk Model Agency was always around. Uh, yeah. But I know it had to start one day. So when did it all start? And I know you wanted to be a model when you were young, but who were you even looking up to back then? Back when I was a, a teenager and in school, I um, I was a very average student is what I would call myself. Um, and I was even told my first year in college not to come back because whatever I did had to be working with people. That I was just completely lost in the course that I was doing at the time, which was business. And um, funnily enough, hello, and there I am in, so, in business now. But um, And what they said that you're not good at working with it, people? No, they just said, whatever you do, don't work in an office environment. They said, you're definitely going to be, a, a, you need, you're a people's person and you need to work with people because otherwise you're going to be lost. So whatever route you take, make sure it's with people. Okay. And of course, as, as a teenager, my whole thing was I loved fashion. I always wanted to be the world's next top, next top model. I had dreams. And I suppose at the time, I, I really would have probably very much looked up to Celia Holman Lee in Limerick. And um, she would have been a huge role model at the time. And I always said, God, I'd love to model with her or love to model in the agency. And that's what my whole thing started out in the model industry really started, I suppose, or where my dream but came from. Fashion back then was was more, was it just magazine covers? Like there was no, there was no big massive shows, really. There were standard you know, country fashion shows, I suppose, or whether they went on in the city or, or wherever out the country. But you had your regular fashion shows, your magazines, your newspapers were huge then. So if you got into a magazine at all, you're you're completely made. You were famous nearly like for mm. just making a magazine. But um, so I, I trained as a model in Limerick and um, and I did model there for a while. But I was I was never tall enough to pursue it as a full time career or to go abroad with it. So that was my my dream squashed, I suppose. The reality was the dream was squashed because I could only ever go so far with it. And uh, I moved to Galway when I was 19 years old. And just how did you deal with your dream? Being knocked. Yeah. Um, certainly it was a hit, but but like I kind of like anything else, I, I think I've, I, I've this resilience probably built in me, I suppose. And I said, OK, it's it's not going to happen. Am I happy to do it part time? I am. And that's that's the way it was. So I kind of felt if I got a fashion show today and didn't do it for a couple of months, it was fine. I didn't at that stage. I accepted it. But certainly in this industry, you it, it's like anything. 
and it's like girls that come and even meet me now, you have to be able to take the hits because if you can't, it's really very hard and very hard to keep, keep getting no's. But the other side of it is, is that if you're not for some one person, that doesn't mean you're not for somebody else. True. Yeah. So it's like me, even if you don't get to sign with our agency, it doesn't mean that you wouldn't be able, you wouldn't be able to sign up with another agency. It must be very frustrating, though, where a dream you have, you can't pursue, you can't bring it as far as you want to because of a physicality. Yes. Uh, and that being something so simple, height. Correct. Which is, I think the guards was the other ones who That's maybe right. had that restriction. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's pure bonkers, isn't it? It is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and I know, thankfully, it has changed a lot nowadays where... It sure has. The height, the size, the type of hair. And it's about the, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now there's still standards and there's still, from a point of view of, for the really high-end designer shows, and um, they are specific criteria to get that work. And the height is still a huge factor. But in saying that... I still, for me, I have models of all ages, of all sizes. I have never in the 25 years that I am in business with Catwalk Model Agency have ever told anyone to lose weight. And I never will until I take my last breath. That will never happen because I believe there's work for everybody regardless of your size. At fashion shows Mm -hmm. where they say this needs to be the minimum height. Do they also give specifications on weight? Yes, they do. Even today? Yes, yeah, they have to be a specific size because um, when designers are designing their pieces, which are just for showcase only and um, not necessarily for the for the market, this is just piece that they design specifically for a runway. They, they do request that models are a specific size. Yes. OK. So that criteria will and it still is there. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. It, it, well, it's just it must be very difficult for someone who might be, you know, slightly overweight. Mm. Um and you're seeing, you know, a beautiful woman wearing a garment, knowing in your heart and soul that that just won't fit you. And, you know, maybe it'll never fit because there mightn't be additional sizes created. And obviously there's still this thing of, I don't think it's the fact that these millionaires are running out of garments material that they can't make sizes slightly bigger. Of course. But that there's still this thing of, this is a definition of beauty. Height, this height, this size, this weight. You know, for a population of 8 billion people it's in the mad, world. Isn't that it? were, it's crazy. It's yeah. so distinguished. I, I agree with you. And even like you had fo- you found that a lot of, say, international shows, the likes in Paris, London, they had looked at getting more of a plus size models on the runway, which they did. And, and it was brilliant to see. And they still do. But there is a certain standard that is still there. And there's no point saying any different about it. It's still there. Mm. Even though I have to say from my own behalf, because I do want this to be quite clear. We do have models on our books that are five foot three. My most recent signing, she's five foot three in her 30s and um, and she does quite a lot of work with us. So there is work there also for petite size models or petite size people. So it's yeah, not and, to and kind to of break the, you know, the people don't think, oh my God, that's my dream over with because it's not. Well, to give uh, credit where it's due uh, and I won't name the model, but I remember years ago, it could be 15, 20 years ago, that there was this woman who started modelling for a catwalk model agency and she was from Galway and I knew her um, from years ago and I thought, wow, this is so cool. Like, I know this person. Now they're a model for this agency that was doing stuff all over Ireland and she was never a tall girl. And that's gone back like 15, 20 years ago. So even back then, you were taking people mm-hmm. of different heights, which I think is important for people to know because you're not reacting to change in the industry now. You're, I'm you're encouraging making changes. It. You're encouraging. Yeah, you absolutely. Know, and ago. it's the one thing, even with TAFE, for the, like for the example of, that we're doing the work with, with Ireland AM, our specific brief is we want real people. Mm. That is our job. We need to produce models that are real people and that people at home can sit down and say they can identify with them. And that's, uh, and yeah, this is it. the brilliant. people watching the show are, are normal people. You yeah, know? absolutely. And it's great to be able to see everything's going to look amazing on somebody that's very tall or quite slim or whatever. But equally, you need to be able to visually see it can equally look so amazing on somebody that's curvier yeah. or shorter, you know. Yeah, because I've heard you make the statement for it's you have to wear it. Yes. Yeah. You do have to wear it. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not good at that <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> It reminds me, and I, I don't think I told the story before on the podcast, but, you know, listeners would know that I worked in radio for a number of years. And when I set up GK Media 
in 2013 I think it was that year or the following year I was doing some evening courses in GTI teaching radio for adult students and as part of the 10 week program I'd bring them to the radio station for a night and give them a tour and there was pictures of all the presenters up on the wall and there was my picture up on the wall and I was leaning up against the counter in reception reminiscing looking at the picture and saying to the students god that that picture, wow, that's seven, that's that's nine years ago that photo was taken. Nine years ago that photo of me was taken. And then I looked down and I realised the cardigan I was wearing in that photograph, I was wearing <laughs> then as I was doing the tour of the radio station. <laughs> you need a stylist. <laughs> <laughs> Completely, yeah, yeah. You know, even if people watch these uh, these video assets of the podcast, it's pretty much the same kind of shirt I'm it's wearing okay, all the time. okay, so you can wear it well, you're yeah. fine. <laughs> It's great for people to see that variety of, of clothes that they can be wearing now and to get that confidence to wear it. But let's go back. 25 years ago, you started Catwalk Model Agency. Right. So you had done business in college. You didn't continue it on. No, so, I only did one year. So what happened then that you decided to set up your own business? My initial background is in health and fitness. That's where I met Ger, my husband. I worked for a health club in Limerick. I went back to UL in Limerick and trained to be a fitness instructor. And to be fair, I absolutely loved it. I worked in a, in a health and fitness club in Galway called Peak Physique. And in the meantime, the man that had bought out the business and I had a very, very good relationship. And I went to him one day and just said to him, I would love to set up a model agency in Galway. I think there's an opening here. And I I always quote back to this because it's kind of quite, quite funny, but I, I contacted a couple of businesses in town that would work with models or that would run fashion shows every season or whatever for their businesses or whatever in the, their shops or whatever. And one particular guy told me, Are you absolutely off your head. He said a model agency in Galway is never going to work because at the time, everything really was Dublin. Everything happened in our capital. And I'm there thinking, but if it's happening in Dublin, why can't it happen down here? And why are we bringing models from Dublin to Galway? And um, then I contacted Anthony Rines, as you know, well-known department store and very successful store, still obviously very much in business here in Galway. And when I contacted them, they used to have this most amazing, elaborate fashion show every year in Galway that everyone bursted to get tickets for. And of course, and I was one of those people. I, mo- I modelled at it. You're joking. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, so you know, but yeah. it was massive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Gary, like, fun. I mean, to be a part of an Anthony Ryan fashion show, I'm telling you, yeah, back that time yeah. was probably, and I'm not exaggerating on this, I'd say it was probably one of the biggest fashion shows outside of Dublin, actually, mm-hmm. that they ran for years. And of course, they kind Because of, it was the place you went to get clothes. Absolutely. And like, and people looked up to them. And there was money and pro- money spent on productions and on professional models and people just were in awe. That's really the truth. And I remember contacting them and just saying, listen, if I opened up an agency, would you be willing to work with me? This is where we always only work with this particular agency in Dublin. And I'm going, oh, OK. And then I chatted with Ger, and we were only about a year married at the time. And I got married very young. I was married at 23. And I have a daughter now, 21. If she told me she'd get married at 23, I think I'd lock her up. But anyways, <laughs> and we'll get, that's another day's story. But, um, but like I just said to him, I said, do you know what, Ger? I said, there's an opening for a model agency in Galway. And he says, Mandy, why don't you do it? And within six weeks, I roped in a couple of my friends that I knew. I trained them from what I had known from my training background in Limerick. And um, I was and were you picking people who you knew from the gym even? Yeah, absolutely yeah. I was. People that I knew, I just said, OK, we need to run a fashion show. And Michelle Burke, well-known um, auctioneer here in Galway, they, and her husband Tony that had, at the time, Windsor Motors, and they planned on running a fashion show to promote their, their business, their showrooms. And I said, would you think about doing a fashion show? And she said, absolutely. So our very first fashion show was in Windsor Motors with Mary Kennedy from RTE mm. as MC. So I modelled on the same night myself and it was a huge success. That is mad because it's so out of context. Completely. Models in a showroom for cars. Yeah. They ran that show for numerous years after. And Gary, like, I'm not being funny, but it was actually the show to be at. It was massive and people from all over came to it. And it, the showroom was completely cleaned out of all the cars, obviously. It was cleared out and this proper stage and everything was put in and, and lighting and everything. But it was, wow, it was just fantastic. So that's where I started my very first show. And after that, it was still part time. I was still working in the gym at the time. Now, sorry, were these clothes from different businesses around? They were from different sh- local boutiques. So yeah. you had all that going on as well, sourcing. Correct. 
the costumes or the everything. The dresses, so we did. Whatever. We literally that was the one thing about Catwalk Model Agency and. Thanks to Jer. Jer is a huge part of the production on the team. So we used to do the staging, the lighting, the music and um, provide the MC, the model. So we were able to and we were the only actually agency that could walk in with a full package. So nobody had to outsource anything outside of the business. So it was from day one, we had that nipped and we made sure we were going in with everything. And it was brilliant because we knew everything was under one roof then or whatever. And had you like looked to what others were doing and saying, OK, this is what we need to do to be different. Yeah, absolutely. Went went to every fashion show, got different ideas from different people. Do you know, Gary, I still do it because I have to, because we had this conversation before we came on air. The day you stop educating yourself in your industry, you're in the wrong business because you have to keep on top of things. You have to keep current and and that's where you learn. And from, from there, we literally never looked back. And I was still managing um, the health and fitness club here in Galway and running Catwalk at the same time because it was only part time because obviously the work wasn't there to sustain a full time wage and whatever. It just wouldn't be for even nowadays for models modeling full time in Ireland. It's it's almost impossible. Most of them are working or in college yeah. to, you know, to have a proper full on income to come in. And I, I think it's great as well because... They earn an income from being models with the agency that helps them get through college then as well. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's a, a great sideline. Yeah. And honestly, you know, I, I can't speak highly enough because so many people often have a perception of models that they don't eat or that it's an unhealthy environment. The models are like my kids, Gary. That That's a fact. It's like as if, as I do say, they're like the 40 or 50 children I didn't plan on having. And it is and it's true. And we're, we're as thick as thieves. We stick together for everything. If there's anything wrong, we all help out. And, and that's what it's about. And I, as I do say to people, this is how our business works. And either you fit into the mould of that, I'm not for you. And you're not for me. Yeah, I want to get more into this because I've always found that the models that work with you in the agency, there's a real family mm-hmm. atmosphere. There's a great culture there. Yeah, absolutely. And but it, how do you keep that? Because... I would be very much on the ground with the team because I don't believe it's just me. It's just me, Mandy Maher. Yes, in regard to going out and getting business or sourcing business, it is me. But ultimately, for me, it's a full team. And the day I I can't forget that and I don't forget it and I don't take it for granted because I can do so much and deliver. But if, if the crew can't deliver what a client is looking for, then there's there's a breakdown in communication. So we just all work together and I'm very open with my team. I'm very direct. But then in saying that if they have something going on in their lives outside of working hours, they know they can ring me at any time, day mm. or night. And but it, like, have you found that women, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to throw gonna, this at you now. A curveball, you're going <laughs> to yeah. fire at me here. But have you noticed working with women compared to men that the women can be more bitchy amongst each other compared to working with fellas? If I'm being honest, we don't have that environment. People might find that hard to to. to so to, even outside of work, have you? Because, y- yes, because, absolutely. Because one, one pet hate I have, and I, and this is something I've always noticed when I walk the prom. Yeah, I come across. You know, you, you get snippets of conversations as you're passing someone who's coming mm. towards you, and any t- well, not any time, but a lot of the time when it's two or three women together, they're bitching about some other woman. So. And I've said it before to my wife and she said, yeah, women have a tendency to do that. And the, I can even see it in my daughter's class. There's this kind of, yeah. whereas the lads are, you know, happy out playing Minecraft or football or whereas there seems to be something going on in the, the women. And I just wonder in that intense environment, stress, beauty, you know, a lot of pressure and moving fast and, and all this, you know, how do you control that not happening? I, I'm actually very lucky, but I do any of the girls will tell you I don't belong knocking a peg or two if I have to. Okay. And um, if I feel there's something that could be going on in the background, I'll nip it straight away. So it's a phone call and it's either this is the way it is or whatever. And um, I have to say the team get on very well. And if they don't, I, if I'm being honest, Gary, they won't stay with me. Mm. I, I, I would finish up with them because I just, it's not what I want. I feel I've, I'm busy enough without having to be dealing with mini dramas yeah yeah and um, and the girls will tell you that I, I 
the girls make friends for life in this industry as well as the guys mm. and and it's a it's really fun while a lot of people probably don't realise is that it's huge hours very long hours unsociable hours very unsociable hours and we were definitely always working when everybody else is off or we could be down in for example like we're in Cork now this weekend we've three shows back to back this weekend three hours down three hours back three hours down three hours back so listen so no one sees the other side of it but it's the commodity and the crack that we'd have in the car we'd have honest to God and you'd be saying about models not eating if you saw the rubbish that's eaten in the cars on the way up and down the road you'd be thinking we, we, we'll fit into nothing but it's just but they're the probably fun. at that good age where the metabolism is still strong uh, yeah. yeah but with the crack and you'd be yeah. hearing all about their lives or about family or about boyfriends or about God knows what's going on but all you could do is laugh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it, and actually even for me myself it keeps me young to be honest with you because it keeps you with them if you know what I'm saying so and have you noticed we'll say those in their early mid-twenties over the 25 years of the business have you noticed a change in personality of that age group it, things are very different um, and possibly a lot of that would be down to social media, I would imagine. Yes, but absolutely. And I would say possibly a lot of the younger girls are way more confident than what they would have been years ago. I think they're actually way more confident now than what they would have been years ago. So the, you think social media has had a positive effect, generally speaking, on them? It it has and and it can also have a very negative effect because people now probably question themselves more, I think, um, without a shadow of a doubt. If you had someone on your books who was really, really good, mm -hmm. but you felt that they were toxic, have you had that situation before where you've had to just say, this isn't working? Um, no, I haven't. But I, as I said to you, I'm very, um, I'm very direct. I, I, I don't, I don't pull punches. I'm very black and white. This is how I operate. But I would always say that if they can't get on with each other, then I'm not for you and you're not for my business either. Because I feel if they're like that among each other as a team, they're going to bring that out into my clients and it's not what we're about. And I have to say, that's the one feedback we get back all the time from the people we work with is how friendly the girls are or the guys, obviously, in, that, in whichever instance, or, you know, that they're helpful, that they'll pick up clothes after us, that they'll bring the clothes out to the car for us, that it's, if I'm on the floor, which I regularly am picking up papers on the floor, or cleaning up a room before we leave after doing a, a job or a gig, I expect the models to be down on the floor and helping me with it. You're just looking for fibres, aren't you? So it's just, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> no fibres, I'm afraid. But, you know, it's just like, I don't expect them to do something I won't do and I don't expect them to let me off doing it either without help, helping me. And and I keep saying to them, it's amazing to get a great job today, but always remember you're working on your next gig. Absolutely. And the day you stop forgetting that and you understand that for yeah. being in business, Gary, we're in serious trouble, if that's mm. what you think, because it's not about, it's great getting a job, but it's you're always working on the next job. So never to forget that. And if they forget that, they're in the wrong industry. Yeah, 100%. Because it's a very small industry as well. But we always say it even doing videos for customers, you know, you drop the ball on one video. It doesn't matter how many you've done in the past. Mm -hmm. If they're not happy, they won't come to you next Correct. time. Correct, yeah. You know. Um, where did the business reach its peak? I would say when I went full-time into the business, which was actually 18 years ago now um, Josh was 18 I, I finished up in the gym after I had him because it just started to get too busy so I knew either it was either wrap up or give this a go and I worked exceptionally hard I'm I've I'm headstrong mm. so if I get something in my head I'll keep going and I'll keep asking somebody for something it's no more than we go back to the Anthony Ryan instance like every year I used to ring them and say can I get your show next year can I get your show next year and I actually did and they used to laugh at me and, but they always took my calls and they were always fabulous to me and then um, no 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 next thing one year yeah we're going to give it to you and I'm going what and they're going we're going to get it and I'm going and, I, and that's my conversation used to be and I, I mightn't get it now next year I said, but I get it the year after you know and that that used to be the fun phone calls we used to have and now today sure he's an amazing client to mine, but we just have an amazing relationship. But I, if I want, I'll always ask and all people can ever say is no. And that's the one bit of advice I give to anyone listening to this podcast. Ask. The only answer you can ever get is no, if that's the case. Or you might get a no and you might retry again. It's it's like, um, it's like when I became a stylist with Ireland AM. I kept asking them and asking them, could I get a fashion slot on Ireland AM? 
and no, 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 we have our own team. And eventually one day I got a call and they just said, listen, just come up and meet us. So I, I arrive up to the, to the Ireland Dame Studios and I'm here sitting down with two young ones that I could have given birth to. And I'm kind of like going, oh, Jesus, like literally I'm going, Christ almighty, I've got to sell myself to these two. That's a fact. There were two young girls in their 20s and I'm here thinking, with all my experience, I had gone to college in, in the London College of Fashion to become a stylist because I just thought it was a nice sideline to have with the industry I was working in and whatever and to have that background, not necessarily wanting to do full-time styling. But, um, and I just said to them, I said, to be honest, girls, I said, I'm not going to sit here and sell myself to you. I'm years in business. I know what I can do. I'm not going to be so bad on air that it's going to shut your program down, but at least just give me a shot. And, you, and if you don't like what you don't, fair enough, I won't do it anymore, whatever. So I left it at that with them, both lovely girls. And um, I left. And as I was driving down the road to Galway, I got a phone call and said, will you come up on the 11th of January? Brilliant. 2016. And I haven't looked back since. I've been with them since. So is that when you feel you kind of, you reached? That from a personal level, that was a huge thing. Yeah. And like, listen, Gary, you, you understand the industry and you understand media. I never take it for granted. I could be gone next week. Mm -hmm. And that's the reality of the business I do. And it's a lovely part to have for me that for me personally I love doing Ireland AM because it also builds my own profile I suppose and it you know keeps us out there and it keeps you in the in the limelight I suppose of being nationally seen on TV or whatever but in saying that in the next bit they're fabulous they're a great team up there they're great fun pro very professional obviously but it's I don't take it for granted as I said things change younger blood could come in I, I never know from when I never did another if I'm going to be back next month or not yeah. but as long as I have it it's great I was swimming with my youngest girl there on Saturday. She's four and I'm in the pool, in the swim pool. I met a friend from school who I hadn't seen in 20 odd years. And we were laughing, saying, well, look at us now in the pool with our kids. And uh, 20 years ago, the divment we were getting up to and all that. And he was saying, uh, oh, what do you do now? And I said, I have a media marketing company. And he said, oh, uh, when did you do that? I said, oh, we're actually 10 years this year. And he goes, oh, wow, you're on the pig's back then. You've, all, you've made it. You've You've gotten that far. And I thought, well, unfortunately, <laughs> you can never have Absolutely. that confidence. Never. And, you know, as I said to you, we work all over our business. As you're saying now, our business started off in the west of Ireland in Galway. But I knew for our business to survive, we had to go more national. And we did that. We started traveling the length and breadth of the country doing fashion shows or like that, getting models booked for brochures or photo shoots or whatever the case may be. Then I got a call to go and do a show abroad in Europe. So that was probably the pinnacle of, of, of our business of Catwalk and um, where we worked in Amsterdam, Barcelona and we now we've worked in London and um, and how all that came about is that this lady, um, Ruth Larkin, she owns um, a bridal distributor business in Athlone. She's based in Athlone, but she doesn't actually sell in Ireland. Her business is based in Europe. And she invited the models and myself to go over and do a show for her in Amsterdam. So we went over for a weekend. I think there was five of the models and myself and we went over and I produced the show and it was all very successful. And um, it so happened that the company that she sells for is the third largest bridal people in the world. They're based in Utah in the States and the president of the company came over to meet us all for the weekend and wanted to see a horror in business and whatever. So, you know, everyone was kind of bound to this man as he was in the room because like obviously the president of the company was in the, you know, in the house basically. And so it ended up that we were due a break and I was hungry. So I said, I'm going to go for a lunch break. And I just turned around and said, Tom, would you like to go for lunch? And he said, Mandy, I'd love to. So we went out and we were, we were really in the middle of nowhere in Amsterdam. <laughs> <laughs> where the show was on as in like near any restaurants or anything and so there was nothing around so um, we saw McDonald's so I brought him to McDonald's <laughs> and we sat there at the table and we had a burger and chips and a coke and we chatted and lovely man and when I came back um, to, to continue on to do the shows for the afternoon for the client she says she pulled me to one side and she says I cannot believe she says you have to bring in the president of the company to McDonald's for lunch she almost had it like they nearly had a breakdown and I'm going but Jesus there was nothing open I said sure he didn't mind she says do you realise who he is and I says but sure I said like no, you, see, you see Gary you get me <laughs> yeah, right yeah, yeah. I, I, if, if for anyone that doesn't know me I can't do bullshit I'm going to say it straight out I just can't I mean just be yourself Jesus like not lo don't lose the run of yourself is what I'm saying here but it's probably refreshing for him because I've seen that in organisations <laughs> where these people are like a god and they tiptoe around and there's no honesty or transparency in that sort of relationship but there isn't and do you know what he went he went back and said to her he said um, he said Ruth he said um, 
every European job we do going forward, Mandy is to get it. So that was the impact of our McDonald meeting. And we, we often joke about it, about our international dining experience is what he calls it. <laughs> and we do a Zoom call to each other once a month. Always keep in touch and chatting. He's just an amazing man. He's been to our home. He's met with Jer and the kids and indeed have met with his wife and family. Just the loveliest man. And indeed to Ruth that has her business based in Athlone, a very successful businesswoman. We do all her work and she's amazing. And it was thanks to them that we got all the international work because from there then we got London, we got Harrogate over in the UK, we got Barcelona. And then the in Barcelona, it's a massive bridal exhibition. So you've got literally bridal designers from all over the world showcasing in Barcelona um, for a weekend. And they do a fashion show. The show itself is probably about, I'd say, over 100,000 euros to put on. It's a massive production. I mean, it's the stuff you dream of. It's the stuff that we see when you sit back and watch these Dior shows and stuff. That's the level of a show it is. And because of Maggie Sotero, that they were involved in the show, they wanted me to produce it. So I ended up having to produce one of the biggest shows ever in my career. And I had um, two of my own models from Catwalk Model Agency in that show, along with international models, some that had graced the covers of Vogue magazine. That was the level we were at. So I had a pinch me moment. Mm. Did I almost have a meltdown? I did. Can yeah. I go on Jesus? Am I going to be able to deliver? Of course. Am I going to be able to do this? And obviously the whole team were all Spanish. So then they all obviously then start speaking English oh. to me because of the, the, you know, the no Spanish. Yeah, yeah. And um, it was the most exhilarating, exciting unforgettable experience I ever had in my life and that was when I knew Jesus we've we've done well here that's when I knew we've a good business we've a good agency and after a big event like that the big come down do you know what I'll give you a laugh and this is what I love about catwalk and what I love about all my babies that work with us the following day after we flew in from Barcelona, we had a show in a school hall outside of Portumna over that direction in Galway. And half the girls that were actually with me in Barcelona were at that show as well. And we were behind the stage in a corridor, a school corridor. And I just went, Jesus, lads, what a change like from <laughs> Barcelona to back, you know. We've but definitely said, made it now. <laughs> but you know what? It was the normality that was incredible. And it's our bread and butter, Gary. And I think, honestly, that's the one thing we've never forgotten where our bread and butter comes from or who we are. We're ordinary people. This is just what we do for life as a, as a job and not to lose the run of ourselves. And the girls will tell you that. I'd knock them a peg or two if I thought they were getting above and beyond themselves because it's not what Catwalk is about. It's not what we're about. And it's not the business I built. I want people to know that we're just ordinary people. This just happens to be the job we're doing. And regardless of where the job is, whether it's Barcelona or in a community centre, to me, the community centre job is as big as what we did out in Barcelona a few days previous. And have you ever had the situation then with your models that they're going down a road where they're not respecting their bodies, looking after themselves? Yes, I have had that. I've had girls where have they had problems with eating? Yes. And I've had to deal with that and I've dealt with it because then I'd start saying, if you're just the route you're going, you're going to end up stopping getting work and I'm not giving you work. Because you need to look after yourself, you need to be healthy, you need to be eaten properly. And I would be very conscious of that, very conscious of it. And what about drink or drugs? Thankfully, I've never had either. From what I know, I've never had an issue with it, ever. And again, like that, if I thought it was going to be a slippy road, Gary, they'd be gone because I can't, it's it's not what we're about. Yeah, yeah. And I would hope they'd have more sense than going a road like that, to be yeah. honest. What about the reaction that they have gotten back now? Like you were talking about social media and there was a documentary on recently, Emily Attack, who was on Inbetweeners and just the images that men decide to send her to our social media accounts and the grotesqueness of it. Like, have your models that you're aware of had that sort of content sent towards them or any kind of no, I mean, seediness? No, I mean, the time they did have people message and saying, you know, whatever, like banter stuff, mm. but nothing of... Thankfully, none of them have ever got derogatory stuff, including myself, thank Jesus, I've never had... You know, you have the odd 
you know, message in regards to or whatever. Like, you know, I mean, Jesus, Gary, you're definitely losing, losing the role of yourself. But, you know, like it's... Because I know of influencers who do have people who are married and well-known sending them messages. Yeah. Um, and it goes trying on. Trying to meet up with them and absolutely. all this. Absolutely. Well, uh, it, it absolutely goes on. But you just block them. Mm. That's it. You, just, you can go down the road of replying and all that if you want to or yeah. just block them. And luckily, like, we don't get any of that. No. You'd never get anything really negative or anything like that. It's it, Honestly, you actually don't. So... It has happened. Has it happened to any of our team? Yes. Uh, not the models, actually, but the platform business and influencer side, yes. But like that, I, I always believe if that's the route people go or people are at home, as, I, as we call them, the keyboard warriors, yeah. you know, if you've nothing good to say, just don't say it. And have you even felt that abuse over the years from Never. keyboard warriors? That's great. Never. Yeah. Never. Thankfully. Not saying what They're afraid have. of you. I think I that's don't, what it is. Do you think so? <laughs> I so? Jesus, I think I'm the most easiest going person ever. Yeah. But are you, like you have this strength about you where you know that it'd be very hard now to cross the line with yourself. And I mean that in a, in a good way. There's this great sense of who you are. Yeah. And there is that natural leadership skill yes. in you, even though you, you don't force that on people, but it's there within you. And yeah, like... Even I'm curious to know where does Mandy get that self-confidence, that knowing herself, knowing where the line is, you know, nipping things in the bud? I don't know where it comes from. I, like I I often say my mother, I, I always I always say my mother was a huge, um, you know, a big role model in my life. Um, she's working since she's 12 years old, self-educated, a very successful businesswoman in her own right. And um, now retired, but she's she was amazing, an amazing mother and that pretty much reared us on her own. And um, I'd say that that's where it probably came from. from yeah, because you do have huge work ethic also. Like You're people, always working. I'm always working. Like people think I do, you know, people have this perception that when they see things on social media, which we, I know we will chat about like, but people all think you're living the dream or that you're, you know, everything is all rose in the garden. Jesus, I'm I'm an... I'm a mother at home with three kids like that's a bunker house is anyone else's house or you know when it's um, like you know what could come across as being like out at events or anything like that it's work that's not off Gary off to me has been outside of a pitch at one of my kids hurling mm. matches or soccer matches it's not that's to me is work because I'm having to net work and people mightn't realise that like we get invited to amazing events and, and I go to almost I, I pretty much never say no because I feel if clients are good enough to invite us to turn up at something, I think the least we could do is be there. And as I physically, there was something on I couldn't go. But and and for me, then that's networking because I'm meeting other people in the industry, but I'm also meeting with the owners of the business or meeting with the PR companies or whatever. And you need to be able to keep that door open and that that line of communication from a business point of view. I need to do that, but. Like, you know, I'm I'm still the person that could be back at the car park jumping into the tracksuit and the runners on the way back down again. Yeah, do you know yeah. what I mean? And wherever the event is on. But, um, you know, it is seven days a week. People don't see it. I had an email in on Stevens's morning on the 26th of December at half eight in the, in the morning looking for um, a, an influencer for a booking that week. And I had to deal with it. Wow. So people don't see... My business never switches off. It is seven days a week. So much so that none of the kids even have an interest in, in coming in board on, on my business because, which I thought Amber might. Mm. But she says, Mom, I see the hours you work. So that's what they even say to me. They know it's it's nonstop. But I love what I do. Yep. And I need to get that across because I absolutely adore my job. I really do. I love my work. So what drives you is you love your job. Yeah. And just break that down for me more. Like, what do you love? Love meeting people. Okay. Love having the chats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when you even messaged me to say yeah. about meeting, I said, Jesus, you're going to be ready for this. Like, because I don't kind of <laughs> show up. Like, you know, I'm going to keep talking. But um, I love meeting people. And that would have been one thing that really hit me during COVID. Jesus. It was like, anyways. But I, I have to say, I meet the most amazing people in the industry. I meet people that are tough hard to work with. But Contrary, you mean? Yes. And, um, but it's how to, to manage them. Yeah, people so manage I, them. So I would be quite good at reading people. Mm. There's some people like yourself when you come in, you throw the arms around you, how are you? Are you well? There's others that you can stay where you are and don't invade my space, but you read that quickly. 
and there's others that it would be very they'd have you know hi Mandy how are you you know what's the story and having the crack and how are the kids and blah blah and you'd have the conversation there's others that are straight into work and it's business and that's it and you just so you need you read you read your client mm. and, and you understand that yeah 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 you know and it's something you don't, you don't learn do. in college no that is life experience yeah. no college can teach it to you we were talking about COVID before we started recording and you know I don't want people listening to the podcast going oh not, not another COVID, COVID again <laughs> But, you know, I was saying that we were very lucky that our business excelled Mm -hmm. during COVID uh, because we were essential workers. But everything stopped for you. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. And it still hits me. Can you believe that? I I can see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was huge because everything I worked for, everything I worked very hard for was literally wiped out overnight in a space of 48 hours. And it was, it was hard, very hard. It still hits me. You can see that. Um, I guess like I, I, I'm definitely hormonal this week. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. But it was like um, nothing prepared me for it. We in 2020, we were going to have our busiest year ever in business. We had 40 sh- fashion shows cancel in a space of 48 hours. And what people don't realise, when you're self-employed, when you don't get work coming in, you don't pay the bills. And it's very simple. I'm entitled to nothing from the government. So I have to work for every euro I make. And that's the disadvantage about being self-employed, as you know yourself. Um, Literally overnight, and I went, Jesus Christ, what am I going to do? And I remember on the Friday evening, I sat down and we were having, I, I, as a rule, I try and have it that the five of us eat dinner together, Jer and three kids. And it's not that we're like the Brady Bunch because we're not. But in saying that, I find that half an hour sitting down eating dinner in the evening is the one time we actually chat with the kids what's gone on in your day and what's happened. And we kind of get all the gossip at the table at the one time and no phones. I'm very strict about phones being at a table. Um, old fashioned it is it may be, but it's just, just the policy we have. And I remember the tears falling on my dinner plate. And the kids just looking at me, not knowing what to say. And George says, Mandy, he says, like, you know, things be fine. And I'm going, but Jesus Christ, I says, we, we've nothing left here. It's gone. And your baby, it's like as if you're, my, my baby was literally taken away from me. And then having to know, wondering what's going to pay the mortgage next month. And what's going to pay the car next month or whatever. And then you're, you're just thinking, Jesus. And... I kind of went, OK, this is this is not good. And, you know, you're sitting down then filling out a COVID form to get 350 euro a week to keep a family of five of you going and you're thinking, Jesus, you know, anyways, but which I never claimed. I'm working since I'm 16 years old. I've never claimed benefit in my life. Not that there's anything wrong with it. And I notice some people yeah, yeah, that can't yeah, help yeah. it and they have to do that, obviously. So it's not by any means being disrespectful on that by any means, but I'm working since I'm 16. So that was a huge knock. And then the following morning I went to bed and the following morning I got up and I just said, "Okay, Mandy, you're either going to go a slippy road here and go downhill or else do what you do. You're a fighter and get up and get on with it. And that's the route I went. So you're in contact with probably up to about 70 models at the time of my books. We're, We're on a WhatsApp group, so it means if I've got to tell the models a message, they all get it at the one time. And um, so I contacted all the models and I said, listen, things are not good here. There's a full wipeout done. And um, but I said, we're family. We stick together. And I said, I need to know I have your, you have my back and I have yours. And um, that we're going to have to stick together. We don't know when everything's going to open back up again. But that I'm here for any of you if you need me. And I'll keep in touch and I'll keep you updated. So, of course, everyone messaged back and everyone was very supportive and we're all sticking together and doing this. And then I, I you know, Gary, things were very hard for a lot of the, of the models as well, because obviously a lot of them were in college and all of a sudden now they're at home. They're not working anymore themselves either. And one or two very much struggled. So I'm now worried about them and making calls in the morning with a couple of them, making sure they're up out of bed and dressed. And I did that every day and kept in touch. And then I decided, how am I going to keep this crowd motivated? So I then went online and my niece, who's a fitness instructor, Jessica, 
she um, came online every Tuesday night and I met with the team every Tuesday night and we used to do a half an hour exercise class on Zoom. So the first part of the class was we all had to talk to each other. So I, I used to, of course, had me first speak, going, how are you all, are you all well? What's the story with all my kids? And, and then they'd all start chatting back. So everyone got to talk. And every Tuesday night we met for about, for a couple of weeks, for a good few weeks, about eight or ten weeks. And it was just to keep the contact going. And then, like, obviously then, like, you know, so many businesses were now also struggling. People that we work with, people that are clients of ours, but people that have become friends with us over the years, their businesses were going down the drain because, as we all know, everything started to go online. And a lot of these had no websites to sell their products or weren't really media savvy, social media savvy to be online to sell their products. And they were in serious trouble. So I decided then, um, I contacted the team and I said, listen, a brainwave I have. How would you feel if I got clothes sent to your houses that you'd video yourselves in the outfits and let's get them, I'll put them to get, send me back the videos. And Reese, who's really tech savvy because completely the mother thinks she sends an email and I think I'm amazing. So don't ask me. This is my youngest. So we used to get the, the images were shot in the models' houses. They were sent back to me. Reese had put them together and we put together mini fashion shows. So over a period of a couple of weeks, we ran, I think it was something like 15 fashion shows where we'd have three or four shops participating in each show. And we got everybody back out there in business saying, OK, if you haven't heard of this shop, this is who they are. These are in business here and we give our selling points on them. These are the outfits they have in store. They may not be available on a website, but they, they are available in the yeah. store and whatever. So we started trying to sell their clothes wow. for them online. And every model worked for nothing, including myself. We contacted the shops and said, listen, this is a goodwill favour we're doing for ye. Get the stuff out, return postage back to you as soon as we have the filming done. And that's how we kept alive. So well, all, that's how you kept sane. Yes. But it's still at this moment, you've no income, bar the, Absolutely the PUP no. Oh, no, payments. No, nothing. And is your husband, Ger, I know he was involved in the production side, but did he, was he working on Yes, no, we were job? lucky on that because Ger works in a medical company in Athlone and um, so he was gone every day to work. And I'm not being funny, Gary, but I'm glad he was actually gone because I don't think I could, I actually, being honest, I don't think I could put up with him being at home seven days a week under my feet because we're not used to that. And all of a sudden, even myself, I'm not used to being home all of a sudden. So it's like, Jesus, like, even mentally getting through that block, which I don't think there's anybody that didn't suffer some little bit of kind of being at home, being housebound, not being meeting people. I'm a very tactile person. Yeah, especially for you, like you love meeting people. Yeah. And like, that's what I struggled with. Yeah, with, you were the same, COVID, you're, we're I very couldn't, similar. Couldn't yeah. meet people and... It was awful. Was, yeah. And it was like, then it was kind of like, you know, you're going walking around the block, like around where we live yeah. and I'm kind of like... Me, now, I met neighbours, I never knew were neighbours of ours, which is a disgrace yeah. of mine to say, but like people had moved in that maybe not have had kids in the school, so therefore we wouldn't really have known them then, if you know what I'm saying. So it was kind of like, I'm kind of like saying, oh God, who are you and where are you living? It's kind of like, and I went, now I'm in a small country area where I live and everyone knows everybody. So I, that was one advantage. I got mm. to meet people I, I hadn't met. Mm. But, but this whole thing of not being going anywhere and being completely all of a sudden pinned and effectively it was like the whole world was ending. It was, it was at the strangest of times. Yeah. Strangest of times. So how did you start generating an income for yourself? Well, for the first year, it was completely gone. Uh, nothing. We would absolutely no money coming in. And then, thankfully, a couple of clients that we'd work with, and two in particular that I would like to mention is Carrie Dunn and McElhinney's in, in Donegal. They were fantastic to me. Absolutely brilliant. And then, they kind of just said, Mandy, if we send you down clothes, would you throw them on and model them for us on your page? And I'm going, oh, Jesus Christ, like, it's not it's not what I do. Because uh, mm. I, I, I'm always at the other side of a camera. I yeah. was never one to be put in front of a camera, believe it or not. Like I was kind of one, be, let me behind it, but not in front of it. But but it was coming back now, that dream when you were 16. Yeah, <laughs> oh, well, I'll, gee, well, I wouldn't be losing the of yourself. But, <laughs> but, but it's true. And, and I kind of said, OK, so there you are standing, videoing yourself you know, look at me gorgeous stuff and I'm going, Jesus, lads, why not look ridiculous? Because uh, it was just something I never thought I'd see myself yeah. doing. That's being honest. Influencing was the furthest thing from my head because I, I had no experience in it. I knew nothing about it. And um, so they said to me, well, listen, we'll give you a couple of quid if you're willing to do this. And that's what I did. I, I had to do it, Gary. If I'm being honest, I was probably forced into doing it. I mean, I've two kids, one in college, the other about to start college. And you're kind of thinking, OK, something's going to have to start coming here for us. So I then decided 
I kind of always working on the next best thing and the next thing to happen I'm kind of going okay sit back and see here at the moment catwalk is non-existent which it was yeah. and it was no secret and then I said okay everything's online and I said Jesus there's an opening for an influencer agency here and of course went back to Jerry and I says what do you think about opening it and he says are you actually off your head and I'm going I know but like I said but just think about it I said it's going to be similar to catwalk only I'm doing it online and it's influencing. So I... For me, it makes huge amount of sense because in the UK, there's agencies doing this and it's mm. moderated and it's looked after. And in Ireland, like influencers were having a big impact on retail, but mm. there was just no one kind of like a go-to person for it. Yeah. Like people were working from their homes. People, you know you know, started doing the influencing themselves and on their on their houses or at home and their own business or whatever. But the difference between going to an agency is is that we protect the influencer. That's the other side of it, which, you know From what? Like say sometimes there would be brands that could, you know, utilize or over use somebody and they mightn't be getting what they're worth. And that's where I probably come in because I'm the person that's negotiating negotiating yeah, fees I suppose okay. or whatever but in saying that I, I had no experience Gary so I decided to go back to college so I went back to UCD and I did an online digital marketing course and now if you told me I was going to go back to college I would say to you you're definitely on, a, on another planet and um, I did the most amazing course. I w- initially, we were supposed to go to the college, but then because of COVID and restrictions and about the amount of people they wanted in the building, we couldn't go. So we did it all online and it was fantastic. And I learned a load from that because then I felt, OK, I'm moving my business in, a, in another direction because if I didn't, I don't actually think I'd be in business today. That's a huge, huge statement. You're 25 years in business. Yeah. And the goalposts have changed. Yeah. And you have the courage to go out there, reskill yourself, upskill, whatever, retrain, and to adjust and adapt your business. Yeah. For the market. Yeah. Because I had to. My back was to a wall and I don't like my back to a wall. And I said, okay, how am I going to survive here? And I knew I could not go out and be truthful to clients. And as if I knew it all because I actually didn't and I'm still learning and we had this before we came on air I said it the day we stop learning we are in the wrong business because I learn every day and the day I, I you have to keep learning and you, you learn to grow and there's things I do that don't always work and you make mistakes but you learn from that and by going back to college, at least I got the inside savvy of how digital works because I wouldn't have known. And there's no point me telling a client I can deliver this, this, this and this if you genuinely can't or I don't know what I'm talking about. Or equally for the team I have on the platform business as influencers, I need to know my stuff. I need to be able to tell them, well, this works, this doesn't work and whatever. Or So you said to your models, you say, look, I'm starting up the platform, which mm-hmm. would be an agency for influencers mm-hmm. who's coming on board. Well, actually, no, I didn't. I left the models as models. So that's why I set up a separate business. So the platform by MM is completely for influencers. So I reached out to to people that were on their pages at home and that really didn't know how to probably structure themselves properly in regard to brands, how to work, how it should work on their pages, things that they could do to improve. Because it is a business, like, mm. and there's no point saying any different. Like, I mean, you're doing it because you enjoy it, but ultimately it is a business. So it's important for us that the influences are protected, that they're they're being looked after and getting, you know, getting the proper payment that they're entitled to get. But equally that our brands and our clients are being looked after and that the influencer is delivering for them. But also as well as that, that they believe in what they're doing. Yes. I don't want people talking crap on a mobile phone saying this, that and the other on their social pages if they don't believe in it. Mm. It's like, for example, I, I'm a, I'm a brand ambassador with a very well-known tan company and there's no point me going on talking about it for months and next thing all of a sudden next week I'm talking about some other brilliant tan that's on the market. So you have to stay true to who you are and if you're telling your followers this is what it is, be truthful to them. 
And I think that's the difference between surviving and not surviving in this game as well. So how does it work then as an agency? So you're helping them, you're Mm -hmm. training them, which you would have done with models and so on. So are you going out getting business for them? Yes. And then you get a commission on that? Yeah. So how do you price an influencer? So if I'm a business person out there and I say, hi, Mandy, I want uh, an influencer to talk about my, my new mugs. Here. So not everyone's go- on our books is going to be. So the one thing I, li- I love about the platform is that it's boutique style. So in other words, it's small. It's very controlled. It's um, with uh, 30 people on the books. So it's still a lot because you're, you're literally managing 30 people um, separately from the models. But it's um, basically the whole thing is, is that when it, if a client contacts me about promoting the mug for argument's sake, there'll be certain people on my books that we know that could do that. So they need to fit into the criteria of promoting what they're doing. So, for example, you're not going to get somebody promoting fashion if or I'm not going to promote, like, say, cooking a chicken in my in my kitchen when I don't do food or don't do cookery on my pages. So you need to stick to what you are. So the first thing I would say to an influencer is, well, who are you? And do you have that variety, do you think, yes, with the we influencers? Do. Oh, yeah. I do. We have a selection of influencers, whether it's fashion, beauty, lifestyle, fitness, a foodie. So mm. we would have different categories for different. Uh, so that's why the foodie people really would be doing fashion. Yeah. Or the fashion people isn't all of a sudden start cooking chickens inside in their kitchen because mm. it's not what they do. So that's how that we would separate them on that. And basically, if a client comes, it all... It really boils down to how how many followers they have, but also down to the engagement that they would have on their pages. So in other words, their engagements and their reaches are vital on their pages. So that is where that's where their fees will be would be broken down to then after that. Can you break that that down more for people? Because it's so important what you're saying there. And I think a lot of businesses out there, if they have a presence on social media, Mm -hmm. they think that's all they need to do. No. Oh, my God, no. I would say to any business And the one thing I learned and by going back doing my digital marketing, if you are not social media savvy nowadays, your business will find it very hard to survive, particularly if you're in the hospitality, the retail industry, that kind of an industry. You definitely have to have a big presence when it comes to social media, without a shadow of a doubt, because, you know, we're we're, I'm one era now and I'm kind of coming through to the middle phase of life, I suppose. Whereas there's a younger era coming up. They know no different. These are kids that are born nearly with mobile phones in their hands and they're media savvy. And we have to think outside the box. The whole way of advertising is now changed. When we're dealing with PR companies, massive PR companies that deal with thousands of budgets from big companies, the bulk of their budget now, 80% of their budget is on social media. So businesses need to sit back and think about this. And this is where it's impossible to do everything yourself. And that's something I learned in the last two and a half years because Catwalk was Mandy Maher. Accounts, office, answering the phone, replying to emails, doing productions, making sure models were turning up and they were turning up and that me, myself and I, with the exception of when we're doing a production, obviously then we have other people that would come in and do the productions with us from regarding lighting, music and stuff. So I, I ended up taking on somebody full time in the office She's amazing. She's brilliant. But I learned to hand over. Mm-hmm. And Jesus, Gary, oh God, mm-hmm. that's that's tough. When you're not used to it, yeah. Absolutely. When you're not tough. Yeah. So I would say to, to any business owner, sit back and actually think about where you want to go with your business. If you want to grow it, sometimes you have to think outside the box. Could I have afforded a girl to work with me in the office? Truth, no. And that's a fact. I, I can even, even as I sit here today, th- that's the truth. And um, we're covering her wages, which is brilliant. I'm getting my own wage, which is brilliant. But, but as you said, we're 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 now rebuilding our business again. So that's where I am at the moment. So, um, the perception of having thousands hidden in a way, I wish to Jesus I did. But I'm just saying, like people often like that when they think when you have your own business. But like, from from a social media point of view, you need to be social media savvy every business and if you're not I would say to you sit back and get somebody in to take over that for you and look after it for you because that's the next generation if they want to find out about your business they're not going to be looking at anything else bar probably what's on in front of them that they have in their hand probably 24-7 Yeah well it's so important to bring people in that you're not doing everything because when I started off 10 years ago it was me and one camera and I knew if I wanted to grow the business I need to get help Yeah. Yeah 
And but it gives you, you fresh ideas. We, like you, we, you need time to, to step yeah, out of it. You know? Yeah. Like I was working recently with someone who, how, would, how, how do I say this now without giving away who the person is? But they would be regarded as a very wealthy person. Right. Okay. And, you know, they, they will leave behind, I think, a great legacy of what they have done. Uh, and I was very interested to see what it would be like working with this person. You know, for me, I assume they're a multimillionaire. I don't know because you don't know yes. what they own or what they owe. Mm-hmm. But from the outside looking in, they're a multimillionaire and they've been around for a long time. And it's very interesting to see how this person would operate. And he just sits down and thinks and listens and thinks. And I thought, wow, we're so busy doing stuff. We don't have time to actually think, to strategize, to plan. Um, And it's so important to give yourself that space to do so. And by having a team around you, you can then go off for your walks in the prom and come up with your ideas, be creative, figure out how you want to grow things, solve problems. But if you just go, 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 you're not actually growing anything. You're You're just reacting. Absolutely. And, you know, and you, you said it there about listening. When you have a team, I know every Monday with with Taylor that I have in the office with me, we have a meeting always first thing on a Monday morning. And it's about our week's plan, our month's plan, but also anything we're not doing. I'd always ask her, is there anything we should be doing? Or, you know, any ideas that we could, you know, because you have to be able to listen to them as well, because they need to feel important too. Mm. And equally, they are the business as well with you. So to grow the business, you have to have your team growing with you. There's no point having the team going one direction and you're going yeah, another. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think that's really important. And, you know, things will work. But also don't ever take failure as being a failure, if that makes sense. Because you actually learn from that. <laughs> Listen, as I said, 25 years in the business and I could write, a, I literally could write a book. Yeah. And things we've done, we could say, Jesus, that really just did not work. Or, God, that was amazing. We should do this again. Do you know? So it's, you learn. And that's what I'm saying about learning. But listen to your team is what I would also say. It's a big thing. So you're kind of at that stage now where you're, it's nearly like starting a, a new business from Completely. scratch, isn't it? So you're kind of going back to where you are 25 yeah. years, both with 25 years of knowledge now. Which you can't beat. Experience. Yeah. And that's also another thing because I mean like you've got the younger team coming in from a social media point of view in the, a whole new era. But also as I just say you can't beat the old dog either for the bit of experience which is actually true because you learn and experience definitely stands to you without a shadow of a doubt because I've seen it all at this stage. So nearly at this stage nothing phases me anymore. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And things yeah. happen and it's how you adapt. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about your influencers and, you know, the numbers of followers that they have in terms of the pricing of how much it would be for an influencer. But you're also talking about engagement as well. Mm. And I, I've spoken to businesses who have gotten influencers before and often they're surprised, like one extreme version would be someone said, I had two influencers. One of them has 20,000 followers. The other is 2,000 followers. The one with 2,000 followers generated more sales than the one with 20,000. And it's down to that person that has 2,000 followers. They're engaging with their followers all the time. Vital. It is absolutely vital to be engaging with your with your followers. Because it's like that where you might do a question and answer thing on your pages or whatever on your stories or because you're you're letting them in, you're letting them ask you questions, but equally that you're replying to them or even like the amount of businesses that post things on their pages and they're not liking something that comes back on their page or not replying saying thanks very much Mickey or Mary or whoever yeah, it is yeah. like thanks so much for, for replying on and we're delighted that you had a lovely experience when you were with us or it's vital. It's small things that takes time, but that's what will keep your pages alive as well. Because that's what digital marketing is. It's two-way conversation. Mm-hmm. Whereas traditional marketing, newspaper, radio, billboard, TV ad, it was always one way, yes. pushing the message out there. Yes. And again, people might have a social media presence online, but they're, if they're not engaging, they've just gone back to traditional marketing Absolutely. on a digital platform. But we could have people... That could have, or somebody, not even necessarily in my own books, but it could be an influencer out there that could have 50,000 followers. And you equally just said that somebody that could have ten or 15,000 could end up getting way more 
attraction than what the person at 50,000. So actually, when it comes to pricing, if that person is doing huge engagement and and reaches on their page at 15,000, the chances are we probably would price that job more than what we would with the person's 50,000, would you believe it? Wow. So that's also, so every, from our perspective where we also come in is every single month we update our, our media kits. What a media kit is when a client would book an influencer for argument's sake, they can see exactly for the last month the amount of accounts they've reached, the amount of um, engagement they got and the amount of posts they did, how each post did, how many views they got. So they get a full breakdown. So even if you're dealing with an influencer that may not be attached to an agency because often businesses will deal with people that are not attached to anyone, they're dealing with that influencer direct, they're entitled to see that. If they're paying for something, they're entitled to see that. Mm. So everything is transparent. There's yeah. absolutely no, there's no kind of like being shady about telling people this is what they're going to do or deliver. They can see exactly and they're entitled to the statistics after a, a posting as well, which is equally important for businesses. So you, you know, if you've done work with an influencer, you're entitled to see how that specific job went on their page afterwards. And the great thing about influencers that you're saying is, you know, you can get someone who speaks to your audience to kind of target your mm. audience. So it's like, if you go back to traditional marketing, there's no, you know, if you sell fishing rods, there's no point putting an advert in Farmer's Journal. Yes. You know, you want to put it in a fishing magazine. Yeah. So again, yeah. you want to get influencers that speak to the audience you want spoken to. Absolutely. Uh, and so it's great by going to an agency like the platform who actually knows, look, this is the person mm. that would be ideal they will work for what you want. And like we were speaking again before we started doing the podcast of, you know, at times you've said to people, actually, no, that person won't work mm. for you. I had that conversation with a client on the way in the car to you today. Somebody rang about somebody and I said, that person's not going to be for what you want them mm. to do. We would have somebody else or I don't have anyone on the books at the moment for you. But you have to be truthful to these people. If they're paying for something, it's like the one day wonder, Gary. You want clients to come back to you and you want clients to have a trust with you. Yeah. And if you can't have that, you're you're not going to last in business. So you need to build a relationship that you know there's a trust there that they could pick up the phone and say, geez, well, at least she told me this person's not going to work. And they will come back. And people might think, Jesus, are you refusing business? I'm not refusing business. I'm being honest. You know, and that's that's the difference. And budget wise for an influencer, are you talking like? You can earn anything. Could it be 500, 5,000? Oh what my God, of? yeah, absolutely. You could be, depending on, you could earn anything from 200 euros up to a couple of thousand. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a big industry. And does it work? Yes. Absolutely does. Without a shadow of a doubt. I, I'd say a lot of businesses are relying a lot of their advertising now at the moment on, on probably social media. You see, if I say influencer marketing works, people might think, oh, I'm just trying to push an agenda. Yeah. Um, I think you, as an agency... Oh, where you've seen it working works. on the ground, you know, like yeah. we have had people in here to our office and there's one particular business not too far away from us and their sales is all driven by influencer marketing. I believe it. And what's, yeah. and this person does very, very well. Okay. <laughs> you know, we're not talking small money. But what she does is really interesting. She would get three influencers mm. to push the same product and every influencer will have a code. Yeah. So Mary 01, Discount Johnny code, 02. Whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And then you can very quickly see through the metrics of course you can. which one is selling the best. So then you say, OK, I'm going to knock out the third person, maybe bring back in the top two for mm -hmm. the next campaign. And then it might just become one person for the next campaign. Mm -hmm. And instead of giving them five grand, I'm going to give them 10 grand now yeah. to push it. And like it's it's, you know, it's only by measuring the results you know how to invest for the next. It's completely campaign. transparent. But yeah. I would say also in particular with a product and you're maybe working with somebody for the first time, give them a chance because sometimes if somebody's putting something on their page that may be kind of newish, their followers are kind of going, Jesus, where's this come out of? So at least if they're seeing a consistency, then it starts to get more authentic. But the influencer, no matter who they are or what they're promoting, has to believe in what they're promoting. There's no point saying, because they're getting paid for it, mm. There's no point saying that, oh, you know, th this works. And if they're knowing their heart and soul, it's absolutely crap product. Yeah. And I know 
even with with, the, with our own team, like what we would insist on, with particularly with new products, we would insist on the influencers trying out the product first. So they'll actually have that product probably about a month in advance. And and some have come back and said, Mandy, not happy with this. Don't want to work with it. And we have to go back to the client and tell them they don't want to work with it. Awkward. Very awkward. <laughs> yeah, this is where I get all the craft work. But, um, but, but, but that's Because that's, you're that's losing happened. commission as well. I'm completely. Yeah. But I mean, it has happened. And it does happen, but I would prefer it than, than it not working because at the end of the day, ultimately as well, my job is to make sure the influences are okay, but also my job is ultimately as well is to making sure that the brand is getting what they're paid for as well and that they're happy, do you know? So it's a 50-50, so I'm basically the piggy in the middle. So if you're watching something that one of your influences does in terms of video or, or real, like have you had a moment where you're just like, what are they doing? Absolutely. <laughs> Because everyone has their own style. Yeah. It's a tricky area. And it's like, you know, Jesus, lads, I don't think this is exactly what the client's going to be looking for. But anyway, <laughs> but but this is what I'm on about. Like, you'd laugh, like, even like last night now, you'd laugh at this. I'd put something up my own page last night about about I, about I mascara. I never do beauty. Only that because of the company I do wear my tan with have brought out these mascara. And I'm going, Jesus, I said, how am I going to sit down and tell people I'd pond the mascara? But my thing was, I'm not a makeup artist. So I haven't a clue. Mm. And I'm being honest. And I said that. If you listen to my stories from last night, you'll see that. I'm kind of like, this is how I apply it, but no makeup artist will put on like this. And that's what I'm telling them. Now, the company laugh at me for saying it, but they don't let me change who I am. Because I'm not going to be something I'm not. It's it's like this whole, do you know what I mean? Why all of a sudden am I going to start starting this whole blarney? Oh, why don't you try this slot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the people looking thinking, Jesus Christ, where the hell does this one come out? Because it's not, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> if they're definitely looking for a lot of poshness, don't come to me is all I'd say, or any frills and frounces. Yeah. Do you know, I know what I can deliver, but I'm staying true to what it is. And this is what it is. So it's, um, and that's what, that's what influencing has to be. So you're an influencer yourself now as yeah. well. And like on Instagram, I think you've nearly 20,000 followers. I have, yeah. How quickly has that grown? Oh, Jesus. Um, I've grown, I've grown 10,000 this year, actually. I um, I grew a lot this year, but it, it's growing steady. But at least it's all organic, which mm. means that I know people are following my page or following my page because they like it. Yeah. And equally, people will unfollow my page because they just don't like what I do. And that's also equally fine because people are entitled to their opinion. But is that but having other influencers kind of tag you in things or is that using hashtags or? It's both. It's your hashtags or it could also be that like that if you're lucky enough that somebody big enough is willing to give you a shout out on their page is often you can get a couple of their people to follow your page as well. Um, but growing the page is hard. But and it's it's an ongoing thing. It is seven days a week. You need to be consistent. Yeah, it's and this hard. is another it's it is a tough gig and so you really ideally should be probably doing at least probably three to four posts a week, which is on your page full time. And you should be doing at least three to four to five stories a day, seven days a week. Even if it's only putting up a cup of coffee. If it's both of us putting a photograph up together now after yeah. we finish this, or if it's you know, but have you ever had days where like oh, I couldn't absolutely? Be I went off for the full week of Christmas, couldn't even look at it. I literally couldn't even look at it. I just said, oh Jesus, no, I've just enough for the week, and I literally did nothing for a full seven days. And um, but in order to keep your page going, you have to be consistent with it. That's the only thing. Yeah, because unfortunately, your page will disappear from people's absolutely, timeline. Yeah. Then yeah, if it's not yeah. active and being engaged with, yeah. Yeah, well, it's fascinating. Um, it's a different world, completely different. Did I think we'd ever be seeing this, the route we're going? And to be f really, I know it was always there and it was coming there, but I would definitely say that that's the one thing that COVID has done is probably highlighted the influencing market big time or social media presence or updating websites and things like that. I think personally, one of the hardest things that, influencers are facing is coming across real and genuine and mm -hmm. I know talking about that they'll only endorse a product that they fully mm -hmm. believe in is part of that journey yes. and path but again people can be so critical of others mm -hmm. that they see online and call them fake or oh they got the lips done or oh it's awful well, what goes on is terrible some people get get very bad messages um, from both genders or is there I would say both genders yeah yeah and it's awful and how do you deal with it all you can do is block them but it's terrible 
And is it? And it does, whether you like it or, you know, mentally that does affect that course, person. Yeah. Who's Who's going to want a really, you could do a job today and you could be told you're the most amazing person at what you do. And all it takes is for one person to burst that bubble of something stupid comment or something and next thing that whole thing is just and that's all you think about that and focus on it's amazing but we all we're all guilty of it but um, unfortunately it does happen it does go on yeah that's also the other side of it and what sort of comments or content is directed at them usually there could be comments left on their pages or they could be given private messages more often not probably private messages but about the way they produce the video or the way they could speak? Could be anything or, or could be about their appearance or could be about, you know, something personal could be thrown in. And then, you know, then it's definitely somebody that knows you, which is worse. Yeah, or been, has and, been and, following and you. And actually, actually, it has been known that a lot of people that have gotten bad mar- remarks on their pages is actually normally people that they actually know, which is probably scary. So you've seen the aftermath of that. I have done, yeah. Yeah. And the effects that it can happen on people and it's not nice and it's not good. It's actually scary. I think the industry, the, the social media industry is phenomenal. I think it's incredible. It's credible with what it does. But also is knowing the difference between that and also reality is like what you're saying you need to be able to step back and say the normal day to day stuff, you know, and stop comparing yourself to other people is also what I would say. And should influencers hold back on giving more of their personal life and just treat it as a business or because I think sometimes the more you give of yourself, the more interaction engagement you get. Absolutely. And there's no question on that. But I, I even know I can speak personally about my own page because it's out there. And um, I would rarely put a lot up on my own page personally. If you ask me, I tell you, I, I'm an open book. I don't, if you said to me, Mandy, what are you doing tonight, tomorrow and the next day? I sit here and tell you everything. It's not that I have any secrets, but from a point of view of, um, do I put every single nick and knackle on my page? I don't. Because there's times where I just want to be able to switch off and have that time, whether it's with the kids, whether it's with Ger, or whether it's off at a match or whether I'm heading down to visit my mom or whatever it is. And, um, and you do need to be able to switch off on that. And, because sometimes people nearly feel they, they own you. You know what I mean? So you need to know the happy medium, but then, and and people know they follow your page because they know you're going to be putting up fashion bits or whatever. Like now this morning, I put up a photograph of myself with my two kids this morning, which is, is kind of unusual. I don't do it an awful lot, but the two lads were going, oh, for Christ's sake, man. But anyway, they jumped in for the photograph, so it was grand. But like, then there could be, you know, there's others then that literally share every second of their life from the time they're getting up until they're going to bed that they're making tea, that they're sitting down watching TV, that they're, and people want to know what they're doing. So people watch and follow them for that reason. I remember years ago working in radio that there was, you, you kind of got used to, you know, certain people always contacting you on the show via text. And Bebo was the platform at the mm-hmm. time. And I put up a photograph of myself in the studio um, with a big smile ahead of me. And when I was nine years of age, I fell and broke my two front teeth in school. So I I had caps for years. And I put up a photo and one of the people messaged me who was a listener and said, would you not sort out your teeth at this stage in your life? They're so yellow. This really but before social media. had a huge media, impact on you, Massive Gary. impact. Yeah. Really did. Really did. I don't, I don't understand people sometimes. Some mm. people. Yeah. I do think, Jesus, do you really, is that what it's... Are we that shallow? Are, and what they don't realise is a remark like that, what they might not think is, it's a very hurtful remark. Mm. And personal like that. I mean, I said it earlier on when we were chatting, if you've nothing good to say, just just don't say it. Even my own kids. Yeah. I keep saying to the three kids, I say, guys, often you'll see things and you might want to say something. Hold back. Because unless it's something good to say, just don't say it. Yeah, well, it's someone who we both know very well, Alan Murphy, yeah, worked in Goibia. Yeah, don't, Alan, love Alan. Alan always used to say, if you're going to say anything online, make sure it's the best version of yourself. Yeah, and he's so right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Before we finish up, I have to talk to you as well, because you are a mammy. I am. <laughs> and I'm I a daddy. I love my kids, yeah. And I find it hard juggling yeah. parenthood and running a business. It's bonkers. 
And I think it's even more difficult for a woman um, because I think sometimes lads can get away with certain things. But I think it's it's harder for the woman because there's more of a supportive role I I would find from the women I've seen in my life um, in, in the household. Mm-hmm. And so you 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 have raised mm-hmm. three darlings. I have. <laughs> and the eldest is what, 23? She's 21. 21. 20, 22 in actually in March. Next so month. at the start, a few years in of Catwalk Model Agency, your and eldest child kids, was born. So yeah. they've pretty much been there. From the beginning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How did you balance it? It was absolutely bonkers. I have, um, I had a girl that was a next door neighbour that minded our children when we were gone away because like that, people don't see the other side of my business. They look upon us doing, for example, doing a fashion show and we could be in Cork for argument's sake. So we drive down to Cork, we normally would leave around lunchtime, we're down there early because obviously setups and all those things and rehearsals and stuff. And then we could be looking for home by two or three o'clock in the morning. And um, so that's not the glamorous side of it. They see they see us doing an hour fashion. You're going to think that that's the handiest gig going on looking thinking, Jesus, you really have to clue here because what they don't also realise is that there's hours and days of work pre that event and maybe haven't have gone down to Cork with clients before the show even starts. You know, so there's, there's a huge element yeah, to Yeah, because there's a huge amount of work done beforehand to make Massive. sure everything goes smoothly on the night. And, and I'm not being funny, Gary. Normally the night itself is normally the easiest bit of yeah. it, actually. So when you're actually when the show is live, there's no going back anyways. You have to run it. So it's kind of like it's normally at that stage, it's kind of like, OK, you know, but like having three small kids, I had a, I had a fabulous girl that pretty much reared my children and um, Joanne um, Huben from next door from me in Canvara. She's now married herself and actually so much so that our three kids were so involved in their wedding. Amber was bridesmaid. The boys were bringing people into their seats in the church and then her husband welcomed my three kids into his family on the day of the speech <laughs> and I'm going, Jesus. <laughs> that was kind of slightly embarrassing because you're kind of thinking, Christ almighty, you know, they are my children here. But, um, but she was fabulous. And um, I, I'm i not the one that had the person in cleaning the house and stuff like that. I, I still had my house spotless. I still had everything done. I did my own cooking and whatever. And um, it was tough going. It was very hard. And then both our boys in particular um, were hugely involved in sport. And they were both playing with Murview United here in town. And so we were coming in now to Galway from Canvara and then um, the hurling course locally. And then, you know, we went, went to Galway United now we're back to Merview United and it's like it's bonkers it's busy but it's that was our time out would you believe it being at the side of the pitches and do you, at which I, I am proud to probably say I've I missed very few of the kids matches we've always been at their matches both Ger and I I'm the cycle mother on the side <laughs> I'm like, oh. And the lads always come up to me after match. How was that? And I say, you're absolutely crap. And I'm awful. I'll say it straight out or I'll say you've had an amazing match. So they know they're always going to get the honest truth of it. But um, but, but, but that was our that was our time but, out. But look at your roles. So you, you're a mother of three. Mm-hmm. You're a mother of 70 models. Yeah. <laughs> you're a, a mother mentor for 30 I'd influences. I'd say mentor, yeah. Yeah. You are a daughter. Yeah. You're a friend. Yeah. You're a wife. Yeah. And then there's you as well. Mm. It's a lot, isn't it? It's mad. But you know what? I know no different. And I'm blessed with the people that I'm surrounded by. And I have a very good, my family are amazing. Amazing sister. And um, my mother, they're all very supportive. And what are very supportive to me even when the kids were a lot smaller. Because obviously now the kids are growing up at this stage and and um, and to be fair to Jerry, he's been a huge part of the business. I, I can't take that from him and I'd be wrong. And if I said any different, he's been amazing um, in regard to Catwalk and would always be very supportive to me and always very kind of go for it. He's, he's a real goer himself. And um, it's important to get that support at home, isn't it? To, because otherwise, like it is difficult and, you know, off, you know. Like if you had a negative Joe now at home. Oh, geez, stop. You couldn't in my industry because yeah. it's, it's seven days a week and. Um, it's 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 hard to it's hard to balance. Was there times where I've almost had a meltdown trying to get everything done? Absolutely, I'm not perfect. I'm not the perfect wife. I'm not the perfect mother, but I I would do my best. And um, but my priority would always be my kids. I'd have to say, in fairness, I have an an incredible relationship with my three kids. I I can honestly say that I do, and um, they're amazing. They're gas. They're great. And now even. 
now it's kind of nearly coming more into the friendship side of things, oh, really, because nice. they're yeah. getting older and it's a different relationship. Mm. Um, I remember when that switch happened, really, um, when I kind of had a meltdown in my mid-twenties, but it, it was that switch of going from son to a real strong friendship with my parents. Yeah. And it's lovely. It's fantastic. Yeah. But it's it's also difficult at the moment because you've won leaving the nest. I do. And I'm having a meltdown. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I do laugh. Like she says, she's like the mother in the house. Like she could cook the dinner like a couple of days a week and she'd contact me to the office. She's, where are you? Your dinner's on the table. I'm not going to call you a second time. And I'm going, oh God, almighty, I'm on the way, which should be the other way around. But she's leaving um, home to head to the Netherlands for six months with Erasmus with college. I'm... I'm nervous. I'm very nervous. It's a huge step, even though the other side of me looks at her. She's a beautiful, young, successful girl and what she's done so far. And she's just a brilliant kid. And um, I'm also excited for her because I want her to travel as much as she can while she's out there. And I keep telling her every other weekend and Amber, try and get to a new city and really explore Europe while you're there. Because once you work full time, you won't have that freedom. And um, so it's a huge move. So we're, yeah, it's a massive move. And then... Uh, Joshua started in university in Limerick um, last September and that was another huge change to the household because now all of a sudden we just have Reese at home and um, but he's loving life because he's getting all the attention <laughs> the little maggot but yeah. anyways but you know it's um, yeah it's a huge change massive change but I think positive too you know and it's their next phase in life and you're now I'm back kind of just looking at you and going God oh, it's just back to the two of us again but it's like it's funny yeah. how it goes circle I suppose yeah it is it is yeah as I do say to any parent and anyone that's a parent listening to this and you you know yourself Gary you raise your children to the best you can and with the proper morals and you know knowing the difference between right and wrong but nobody can ever talk and hopefully they can stay in the straight and narrow is all I say and, and that's all I would hope that we've instilled in our kids and once they're respectful of people would be a big thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like one thing I try and do every day is at least once that they laugh. Absolutely. You know, raise, raising happy children is kind of it's a huge thing. my goal and yeah. to have that influence for as long as I can. Yeah. Catwalk Model Agency, how has the industry changed now since Hugely. COVID? Hugely. Hugely. Um, from going to 40 fashion shows a year to where we had just won this season in Galway, which was incredible considering we would have four or five in a season in Galway. And that's just taking Galway, but obviously we're all over the country. But um, the, the whole industry has completely changed. Retail has changed a lot as well. A lot of it's gone online. Mm. And um, then like what you would have had before, like the, the charity fashion shows or, you know, the likes of your GAA fashion shows or your sports clubs trying to raise money for their clubs. They're just not doing them. So we would have had a huge impact on that. And actually, as I'm here talking to you, we're actually in the middle of rejigging Catwalk at the moment because we've had to relook at it. So we're trying to, we're coming up now with a new website um, because we've had to, we have to move with the times with it. And what other way can we change and relook at how we're running the business? So actually, we're in the process of that at the moment. For reasons, but I, catwalk's my baby. Yeah. You know, must have been heaven though, being surrounded by seventy models every day. <laughs> Should their guests? <laughs> I just said, like they do ten things. I go, I really don't need to be hearing this, like you know. But it's, they're great, like you know. And mm. as I said to you, I have a we've a good team, and that's what we all are. We all work together. They don't work for me. We work together, and um, yeah, we've a great team. So as we finish up. What has been your biggest lesson in life? I would say from a business perspective, don't become complacent. Because possibly, I won't say I probably over became that complacent with, 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 with Catwalk in particular. But I definitely say it was, it was an eye opener when everything went in a space of 48 hours. So for me, what stood to me was I'm a worker. Um, I don't take no too lightly, so I'll keep trying and keep learning is what I would say and try and keep ahead of the posse because if you don't, somebody else will come in and whip the whole lot from you anyway. And I would say that's probably what stood to me, that I'm still here. 
Mandy, thanks for joining us. Thanks so Gary much, Talks. Gary. You're, you're so fabulous. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted. Thank you for listening to this episode and for supporting the podcast. And thanks to Mandy for coming into her studio at GK Media in Galway to record the show. Make sure you follow on Instagram Mandy Catwalk, Catwalk Model Agency and the platform by MM. Again, you can stay in touch with me and find out before anyone else who is going to be an upcoming guest by following Gary Talks on Instagram, LinkedIn or TikTok. Have a great week and I look forward to talking to you again on Friday for a short bonus episode of Business Bites. Take care.